So let's now discuss another set of hormones, beginning with what is produced by the hypothalamus. So we have growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, also referred to as somatocrine, secreted by the neurosecretory cells of the hypothalamus. This GHRH will target the somatotropes of the anterior pituitary. And I illustrated the growth hormone releasing hormone receptor that's present on the somatotrope whereby in response to the binding of this hypothalamic hormone, the somatotrope will secrete human growth hormone. Now, the human growth hormone will lead to the secretion of an additional hormone called insulin-like growth factor. So where do we have this human growth hormone receptors? Well, we find it in a number of different tissues, including the liver. So the liver will have a receptor for growth hormone, which will stimulate the liver to produce insulin-like growth factor, IGF. While the growth hormone inhibiting hormone, GHIH, another hypothalamic hormone, also referred to as somatostatin, and upon binding of GHIH or somatostatin to the receptor, once again, found on the somatotrope, then the somatotrope will not secrete growth hormone. Growth hormone is also referred to as somatotropin. Now that we know that the somatotropes secrete human growth hormone, also referred to as somatotropin, let's now discuss its effect. Well, it turns out somatotropin or human growth hormone acts indirectly through IGF, which is also referred to as somatomin, and can act directly as human growth hormone. So let's first look at the direct action of human growth hormone. They are metabolic, meaning it will increase lipolysis, the breakdown of fat in adipocytes, releasing the fatty acids into blood. So I hope it makes sense that if lipolysis is increased due to human growth hormone, then the fatty acid levels in blood will increase. Another effect of human growth hormone acting directly is it will stimulate glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis, primarily in the liver and muscle, will release glucose into blood. Blood concentration of glucose will increase. So what I've done is I've made an illustration over here showing the direct actions of human growth hormone. So when human growth hormone binds to the receptor on the liver cell, for example, the liver cell will break down the glycogen, releasing glucose. So once again, the glucose blood concentration will increase. Another target cell will be the adipocytes, which will have receptors for human growth hormone. And through the process of lipolysis, fatty acids are released into blood, thereby the fatty acid blood concentration will increase. Now, what about its indirect actions? Well, it's going to work through IGF. IGF, or somatomedin, is growth promoting. So this is where we will have increase in muscle growth, an increase in bone growth, and an increase in overall growth. Let's turn to my image where I illustrate the effect of IGF. So some of the target cells of insulin-like growth factors or somatomedin will be, let's say, our muscle cells and our bone cells. So naturally, they'll have receptors for IGF. And in order to increase muscle growth, these cells have to uptake or take that amino acid out of blood and bring it into the cytosol because it's all about increasing muscle growth. And also, glucose will be taken in. So why the glucose? Well, this is all about energy. If we are going to build muscle, if we're going to increase bone and overall growth, then we're going to need the energy for those physiological processes to occur. Turning to this image over here, okay, and this is one of the two images we'll look at. And we've already talked about the stimulatory effects of growth hormone releasing hormone and the inhibitory effects of growth hormone inhibiting hormone. Growth hormone releasing hormone, of course, is also referred to as somatocritin, and growth hormone inhibiting hormone is also known as somatostatin. So the hypothalamus through growth hormone releasing hormone stimulates the somatotropes to secrete growth hormone or human growth hormone. So here is the direct 
action of human growth hormone. It is metabolic and it is anti-insulin. And this anti-insulin effect of growth hormone will be explained later when we actually talk about insulin produced by the pancreas. And here are the metabolic actions as we just discussed through the process of glycogenolysis, increasing the blood glucose concentration, lipolysis, increasing the fatty acid blood concentration, while the indirect actions of human growth hormone will be through IGF. So acting on the liver and other tissues, the liver will produce insulin-like growth factor, somatomedin. And this is all about growth once again. So we have an increase in skeletal muscle growth, cartilage, it promotes protein synthesis, and cell growth and proliferation. Bottom line, IGF leads to the growth of the body. Well, this diagram is just another illustration of the same processes. Before we wrap up, I'd like to talk about glucose once again. So we saw that human growth hormone leads to an increase in blood glucose concentration. So glucose is now in blood, and in turn, IGF will take that glucose and stimulate cells such as muscle and bone to take up that glucose. Lastly, let's look at the negative feedback loop. So once human growth hormone reaches the necessary blood concentration through negative feedback, it will loop back and shut down production of growth hormone releasing hormone, as well as shutting down human growth hormone by the somatotropes of the anterior pituitary. IGF will also do the same thing. Once it reaches a certain concentration, it too will shut down human growth hormone production by the somatotropes. Let's discuss some of the variables that will influence the release of growth hormone releasing hormone from the hypothalamus and discuss one more time the effects of growth hormone, their direct action and the indirect action through IGF, insulin-like growth factor. So some of the variables include the age of the individual, the time of the day, the nutrient levels in blood, stress, and exercise. So once again, here is your hypothalamus secreting growth hormone releasing hormone, also known as somatocrine, which will influence the somatotropes of the anterior pituitary to secrete their own hormone, growth hormone or human growth hormone. So one target organ would be the liver and the liver cells, the hepatocytes, will have receptors for growth hormone, which will lead to an increase in glycogen breakdown also referred to as glycogenolysis. So this will result in an increase in the blood glucose level. So glucose concentration in blood will increase. Now, in addition to the liver cells, another target cell will be the adipose tissue. And these are the adipocytes. They too will have receptors for growth hormone. Therefore, there will be an increase in lipolysis. So now the fatty acid concentrations in blood will also go up. In addition to glycogenolysis happening in the liver, growth hormone will also stimulate the liver to secrete IGF. So the liver, among other tissues in our body, will secrete IGF, and IGF has growth-promoting effects. So IGF will increase overall cellular growth, will increase amino acid uptake, it will also increase glucose uptake. Stimulated cell division and cell differentiation will also occur. Remember that once growth hormone and insulin-like growth factors reach homeostatic levels, then they in turn, through negative feedback, will shut this thing down. In other words, IGF and growth hormone will loop back to the hypothalamus and basically saying, hypothalamus, stop producing growth hormone releasing hormone. Now, as far as the somatotropes of the anterior pituitary, they too are told to stop producing human growth hormone. Let's now consider variables that will influence growth hormone secretion by the somatotropes, such as the individual's age, the time of day, the response to nutrient blood concentrations, and the amount of stress. It turns out that growth hormone fluctuates with age. 
So we see the highest concentration of growth hormone in children and adolescents, which makes sense because that's essentially when they're growing. And in fact, young adolescents will double the amount of growth hormone produced when compared to a young adult. So if we look at this graph, you can see how the growth hormone release decreases with age. So the older we get, the less growth hormone is being secreted. And growth hormone release will also fluctuate based upon the time of day. And this is referred to as the circadian rhythm, known as the sleep-wake cycle. The highest concentration of growth hormone that's being released is during early stages of the normal sleep cycle. So at night, when we're asleep, we really see a peak concentration of growth hormone. The next variable is changes in response to nutrient blood concentration. So this is something that we're going to look at in the next slide. When blood concentration of glucose and fatty acids are low, and an increase in blood amino acid concentration will stimulate growth hormone secretion by the somatotropes. Growth hormone is also altered by stress. So during times of stress, whether it be emotional, physical, chemical, including exercise itself, will increase growth hormone release. In fact, severe emotional stress in children primarily will cause a decrease in growth hormone secretion by the somatotropes of the anterior pituitary. So here's the summary tables that I created once again, this time focusing on growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone inhibiting hormone, and human growth hormone. The top table shows us the hypothalamic hormones, and the bottom table shows us the anterior pituitary hormones. So growth hormone releasing hormone known as somatocritin, the stimuli for its secretion would be starvation, fasting, emotional stress, physical stress, illness, trauma, surgery, exercise, as well as the nutritional content found in blood, such as low blood glucose, low blood fatty acids, and high blood amino acid concentration. In fact, low blood glucose or hypoglycemia, one of the most potent stimuli for growth hormone releasing hormone secretion by the hypothalamus. And the target cells, of course, will be found in the anterior pituitary. And upon binding of GHRH, the somatotropes will secrete human growth hormone. Now, what about growth hormone inhibiting hormone, also referred to as somatostatin? They will be stimulated to secrete somatostatin, the neuroendocrine cells of the hypothalamus, of course, if we have a high blood glucose concentration hyperglycemia, as well as high blood fatty acids and low blood amino acids. Obesity is also a stimulus for GHIH secretion. The somatotropes, of course, are the target cells, and this time, no human growth hormone will be secreted under the influence of somatostatin. If we look at the bottom table, here is human growth hormone secreted by the somatotropes, and another name is somatotropin. And under the influence of human growth hormone, the liver and as well as other tissues will secrete IGF, insulin-like growth factor, also known as somatomedin. And the effects of human growth hormone, if it's acting directly, then it will be more metabolic, such as lipolysis and glycogenolysis, as we see with my diagram to the right. So here's human growth hormone attaching to the receptor found on the liver cell called a hepatocyte, and upon binding of human growth hormone or somatotropin, the liver will be stimulated to undergo glycogenolysis, releasing glucose into blood. So now our blood glucose concentration will increase. Now, in addition to glycogenolysis, the liver cell will also secrete insulin-like growth factor. Insulin-like growth factor, or somatomedin, has more growth-promoting effects, meaning increase in muscle growth, increase in overall growth of the body, increase in amino acid uptake to allow for increase in muscle mass and bone growth, and as well as bone and cartilage growth, part of linear growth. 
There will also be an increase in glucose uptake for energy, and here is the increase in amino acid uptake for muscle growth or overall growth in general. Another target cell of human growth hormone is the adipocyte. So if it binds to its receptor found on the adipocyte that we find in adipose tissue, then the adipocyte will be stimulated to undergo lipolysis. So now there will be an increase in fatty acid concentration in blood. We have a neuroendocrine cell found in the hypothalamus that will secrete growth hormone releasing hormone, also known as somatocrine. And because this is a hormone, it will enter blood, specifically at the primary plexus of the hypophysial portal system. And once again, we'll just refer to it as the primary plexus. It will then travel down the hypophysial portal veins to arrive at another plexus or capillary bed, the secondary plexus. And because its target cell, the somatotrope, is found in the interstitial fluid and not within the blood vessel itself, then GHRH, somatocrine, growth hormone releasing hormone, has to leave blood and enter the interstitial fluid to arrive at their target cell. And this target cell has a receptor, so the hormone binds stimulating the somatotrope to secrete its own hormone, human growth hormone, also known as somatotropin. And now this human growth hormone produced by the somatotropes found in the interstitial fluid. Now to arrive at its target tissue and cells, it has to enter blood at the secondary plexus. From there, human growth hormone will leave the secondary plexus and leave the anterior pituitary, the adenohypophysis. And it does so through the anterior hypophysial veins. And ultimately, human growth hormone, somatotropin, will find its way into systemic circulation. And now once it's in systemic circulation, it can ultimately arrive at some of its target tissue. So one target site would be the adipose, and the adipocyte must have the human growth hormone receptor to make it a target cell, which in fact it does. So human growth hormone, somatotropin, will bind to its receptor, stimulating the adipocyte to undergo lipolysis, breakdown of lipids, which will increase the blood fatty acid concentration. Another target cell among others, is the liver. And the liver, too, will have the receptor for somatotropin, human growth hormone, stimulating glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen, and now glucose is liberated into blood, thereby increasing the blood glucose concentration. In addition, the liver cell will secrete insulin-like growth factor, somatomedin, and this hormone has growth-promoting properties. So one of the target tissue will be muscle and bone, and upon binding to its receptor on these cells, glucose will then be taken out of blood and will enter the cell. So insulin-like growth factor will reduce the blood glucose concentration. Now, what about the amino acids? Well, amino acid also will be taken up by these target cells. And by doing so, this will reduce the amino acid blood concentration. Now, what about other body cells? Well, practically every cell in our body will have the receptor for IGF. And this will allow cellular growth, which then allows for tissue growth, organ growth, and eventually growth of the individual. Now, we have another hormone, growth hormone inhibiting hormone, or somatostatin, produced by another neuroendocrine cell of the hypothalamus, which will also enter the primary plexus, just as GHRH did. It will travel down the hypophysial portal veins, enter the secondary plexus, and GHIH will leave the secondary plexus binding to its receptor on the somatotrope and inhibiting human growth hormone secretion. Before we look at some conditions that involve over-secretion or under-secretion of human growth hormone, let's revisit what's referred to as the epiphysial growth plate. And what I've diagrammed is a typical long bone. 
When a child is still growing in linear growth, which is referred to as interstitial growth, this means that the bone is growing longer. This results in the lengthening of the long bone. Now, this is made possible because of the epiphyseal growth plate, consisting of hyaline cartilage. So interstitial growth will occur within this layer of hyaline cartilage, allowing the child to grow taller. Eventually, at some point in time, this epiphyseal growth plate will ossify. In other words, it will become bone. And when it does, then that's referred to as the epiphyseal line. So no longer will there be a layer of hyaline cartilage. Therefore, the length of the bone is as long as it will ever get. Now, the bone, however, can thicken throughout life, depending upon the stresses or lack of applied to the bone. And when the bone becomes thicker, then that's referred to as appositional growth. Now, this occurs, incidentally, at the surface of the bone. So appositional growth, once again, leads to the widening of the bone. Now, depending upon whether or not this hyaline cartilage layer, this epiphyseal growth plate, is still existing will depend on whether or not the person will have gigantism or acromegaly that involves the hypersecretion of growth hormone. This is usually caused by a tumor referred to as a pituitary adenoma in the anterior pituitary. So if the epiphyseal growth plate, hyaline cartilage layer, has not yet ossified to becoming the epiphyseal line, then this will result in gigantism, whereby the individual can continue to grow taller, reaching a height of eight feet, if not more. So here's a photo of a pair of identical twins. The man on the right does not have a pituitary adenoma, while his identical twin on the left, however, has gigantism. And you can clearly see the difference in stature. Now, if this occurs as an adult, whereby we no longer have the hyaline cartilage, it's now officially an epiphyseal line, it's now osseous tissue or bone tissue, then we have acromegaly. Since linear growth is not possible anymore, instead, thickening of the bones will occur. I inserted this illustration to show the types of changes that will occur. It's quite pronounced especially in the facial bones, including the hands and the feet. And what we have here is a photo of the same woman. This is a photo prior to developing the pituitary adenoma, and notice the obvious changes that occurs with this condition. Hyposecretion is the reverse, where the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary, of course, is not producing enough growth hormone. So under secretion will lead to pituitary dwarfism. And here's a photograph of an individual with this condition. And in fact, he's right next to a man that has gigantism. The differences in height and stature is quite obvious. While the woman on the right seems to be of average or normal stature.